Good afternoon and welcome to this year's Librarian's Virtual Toolkit with the theme of promoting reading. My name is Jonathan Davidson and I work for Writing West Midlands, the organisation that runs the West Midlands Readers Network, and I'll be hosting this afternoon's event along with my colleague Angela Hickin, who manages the work of the network. Angela, good afternoon. Thank you. And a very warm welcome to those watching. It's wonderful to return with another Librarian's Virtual Toolkit. It's actually our fourth year of live broadcasting and bringing what was previously an in-person conference online, condensed and open to a wider library audience, this time slightly differently as a Zoom webinar. Now we love hearing from you, so do say hello in the chat and say where you're tuning in from today. It's so nice to have so many with you uh, of you with us. I've been looking, we've got Belfast and Bristol, Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent, um, Whitby and Wolverhampton, welcome to you all. Um, I think we're, oh gosh, we've gone over the hundred now. So it's really lovely to have you all with us. Um, we will ask you though, as it's been saying in the chat that we'll keep the Q&A function separate today. We'll let you know which of our speakers across the afternoon are available to take questions as part of their sessions. And we'll invite you verbally to do that by typing into the Q&A section. For those and we'll select those to put to our panelists um, but keep chatting away in the chat and don't forget to press to everyone uh, for everyone to read uh, your comments and chat in that function so our earlier annual broadcasts which started back in november 2020 are all available to view at the west midlands readers network youtube channel you can see those under home and also look at the live tab for those streamed broadcasts those have got conversations about still relevant topics from a wealth of really great guests. And today's event is being recorded and will also be published there for you to catch up again or to point your colleagues towards. Now our toolkit programme discusses topics which are central to the way that we as library staff and literature professionals connect with our readership. We'll be bringing you a range of speakers in presentations and panel discussions, looking at promoting reading, the benefits of books, of reading as a social activity, connecting people through a range of literature in different settings, bringing people together socially to feel a sense of belonging and community, or with books and reading at their heart. We'll be looking at reader development initiatives, projects and partnerships with examples from here in the West Midlands and nationally. If you don't have one to hand, a programme with the running order and information about all our speakers is available at the West Midlands Readers Network website under latest news. And for those of you who don't know us already, the Readers Network is an Arts Council England funded scheme, also supported with annual subscriptions from library authorities in this region. Our work strands include readers and residents, the commissioning of short stories where a writer is paired with a reading group to inspire new bespoke stories and we'll be hearing from a couple of those later. The brokering of author visits to libraries and independent bookshops and that topic is one of our panels this afternoon. And other creative reading projects plus training and support for library staff like today, which we really hope that you enjoy. Now, enough from me for the moment. I am delighted to introduce our first guest speaker and get the afternoon underway. We're welcoming back Luke Burton. Around the time Luke was with us last year's toolkit, he was moving into a new role. So we were very keen to invite him back to share this illustrated presentation about his reflections on his first year as Director Libraries Arts Council England. Luke, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Hi, Angela. Hi, I'm actually going to hand straight over to you, Luke, if I may. Uh, thank you so much for joining and I will leave the screen. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for the introduction. Um, I think slides are being shared from your side, possibly. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, it's great to be here. As Angela said, this was the first event that I was lucky enough to speak at when I started this role just over a year ago. Um, so I'm now no longer able to say I'm the new boy. Um, so I thought this is a good opportunity to kind of reflect on where I've where I've been so far in the journey of my role. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. 
So my plan was to just give a bit of a, a background around Arts Council England and, and around the libraries within uh, the organisation, uh, talk a bit about our nas por national portfolio, talk a little bit about national lottery project grants that are one of our main funding streams, um, reflect a bit on some projects and research that we're working on, and then just highlight some sort of priorities that we've got and some challenges and opportunities that I think I've seen across the sector in the time that I've, I've spent speaking to people in libraries uh, across England. Um, and then there's a chance for any questions then if you have any. Uh, next slide, please. So when I started this, um, I was maybe uh, in, in a reflective mood around the, the role in terms of the travel I'd done. So it's a national role, the Director for Libraries. I'm based out of the office in Newcastle, but I've traveled across the country. And actually this slide is updated since then. So, you know, I've been in the role for 373 days. I've made 38 trips on 77 trains, traveled for over 150 hours and been delayed by over seven hours. Um, and actually that's gone up in the last week, but never mind. But I've had the joys of Transpennine trains, cross country, Chilton Railways, Great Anglia. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, actually, this is probably a, a slightly sort of flippant way of saying that what it's allowed me to do is the amazing opportunity to go and visit some of these fantastic buildings. Most of them libraries, some parliaments, some country homes. The libraries obviously are the best ones, but I've been really lucky to be able to go and see the breadth and, uh, and depth of the offer that people have uh, that are delivering from libraries across the country. And it's a real privilege to be able to do that. And, and to go and shout about the work that, that libraries are doing. Go to the next slide, please. So Arts Council England, we are the sector development body for, for libraries in England. Uh, we came into Arts Council England back in around 2010 when the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council disbanded. Um, we do a number of different roles. Uh, we chair the English Public Libraries Working Group, which looks at bringing together sector development organisations like uh, CELIP, Libraries Connected, Local Government Association, Bring them together to discuss challenges and opportunities. We deliver sounding boards with councillors and with heads of service to, to get information back from the sector. We endeavour to provide sector leadership around best practice and uh, ways of working. Uh, we, we engage on a regular basis with stakeholders. We, we have a responsibility to, report, to support all 152 English public library services and we try and engage with as many as we can in different ways. We deliver project work and research and we also uh, produce guidance, and we also fund libraries directly through the national portfolio organisations. But Arts Council is in this stage now where it's looking to refocus from being a grant giving body to being a sector development organisation that also delivers grants. Uh, next slide, please. So this this slide in the national portfolio is is a bit of a dry one, but it was it was the first one that I was given when I started. You know, so I started the week that the new portfolio was announced. And there was a growth from the libraries, from six libraries to 16, a tripling of the investment and an increase of 166% libraries. And also to investment support principal organisations, which isn't easy to say. And I think some colleagues are, are on the, the event here from, from those organisations. But this is, this is a period of growth for the library portfolio. We've gone to 16 libraries to, delivering in different types of environment across different demographics, different programmes. And it's a real testament to the depth, breadth and variety of services that libraries deliver, that modern library services deliver. Uh, and we, we're looking again, at, we're already looking at the next round of funding for this as to what we want to see next time round. And next slide, please. Uh, we also deliver National Lottery Project grants. So the, these are grants I'm sure many of you have heard of, of between £1,000 and £100,000. Um, and they've actually just been refreshed with a new application form. So there's a lot of feedback regularly on, on the process for grant applications. And we're mindful that across libraries and, and many organisations, there's a, a skill and a time commitment to putting in grant applications. So regularly they're refreshing these and looking at um, the language that's used. We've just launched a time limited priority around the universal library offers. Um, there's more information on these on Libraries Connected's web pages, but Essentially, what it means is libraries, public libraries in England can apply for funding that supports outside traditional cultural activity. So health and well-being, digital, reading, um, and, and we're keen to see libraries applying for these and making new partnerships. So if you've if you've got something that you think addresses, you know, health and well-being, for example, then speak to your local library about the potential to apply for project grants to deliver against some of these, because we don't see many from libraries and we're keen to see more. Uh, next slide, please. We also uh, are involved in a lot of uh, projects and research or, or 
running projects, but also um, carrying out research. And um, we, we try and do this to provide a strategic basis for libraries. So project grants deliver to the public and are public facing and the projects that we deliver are much more about strategy and an overarching narrative around libraries. And some of these that we're, on, we're working on at the moment um, impact on, on, I'm sure many people here, you know, we're looking at ebooks licensing models with them. Um, we're funding libraries connected to do that. And they're working with publishers, both uh, multinationals and uh, independent publishers uh, to look at uh, licensing models that better, that better work for both publishers and also the libraries and can ultimately provide a better service to, to communities and individuals. We're funding CELIP, the Chartered Institute, to uh, look at a piece on future libraries and future library need and demand. Uh, we're mindful that libraries have been really reactive and um, and proactive as well, but reactive around the need to address community needs, but actually how do we get libraries in a position where they can plan for the future. At CELIP have just produced some uh, guidance we uh, funded on managing safe and inclusive libraries bases, um, and we're, we're interested in looking much more at the the ethics and values of, of the library profession. We fund the British Library with the Library On project. Um, this is a single digital presence for uh, public libraries in England. And I would encourage you to go and have a look at libraryon.org um, to see what it is that they deliver. They're, they're looking to show a short window, if you like, a front door to, to the, the myriad offers through public libraries and trying to really put on the map what a modern library service delivers. Ironically, as an information profession, we have a really poor handle on our data, and we're in the process of uh, working with a number of organizations to look at a data platform uh, that would allow us to have uh, detailed data on what libraries are delivering locally, regionally, and nationally. We're also working on uh, delivering an accreditation scheme for libraries, which would allow them as a sector development or a service development tool to understand where their areas of strength are and where they could improve. And there's also a lot of uh, interest tied to the data point around social value and how libraries can demonstrate beyond the traditional metrics of numbers through the door and issues, but actually how do libraries demonstrate their impact and value to the community. Um, and we're really interested in trying to get a, a deeper and richer understanding of what the library offer, uh, the impact of the library offer. Uh, next slide, please. This is giving me flashbacks to, to COVID presentations, so apologies for that. Um, in terms of priorities, I suppose these are just, you know, there's a, it's a small sample of the, the sort of thing that we're interested in understanding more and getting a better handle on. And, um, you know, for us, we are, for all of us, you know, emerging technologies and not least of all, artificial intelligence is something that's been um, in the media and is becoming ever more part of our lives. And I think libraries have a key role to play in extending that digital literacy and that digital skills to how do we engage with, with artificial intelligence and machine learning and how do we understand the quality and the the background of the information that we're getting how do we critically appraise it and that's the traditional library classic library skills i think libraries are going to continue we're, we're continuing having a priority around literacies in all its forms whether that's digital literacy algorithmic literacy um health literacy and, and literacy full stop you know we're, we're looking at all of those as priorities for us the digital infrastructure that libraries provide as well. So the People's Network, which was that network of computers that was provided back in um, at the end of the 90s and early 2000s, which has become such a key part of the library offer. What do we need now for a fit for purpose digital infrastructure for public libraries to support new ways of working, mobile technologies and emerging technologies? And of course, reading for pleasure is still key and vital to what we, we, we see as, as part of our role. Um, and that, that ecosystem between libraries, publishers, uh, bookshop shops, in particularly independent bookshops, writers, readers, libraries. How do we, we want to bring that network together to, to advocate for the benefits and the joys of reading for pleasure? And also li how libraries to tackle some of those big societal issues, you know, climate change, tackling loneliness and isolation, um, active citizenship, you know, uh, m tackling misinformation. Libraries have a role to play across all of these and how can we support libraries to, to address those needs. Uh, next slide, please. And there are inevitably challenges that come in, in the world and that's not unique to libraries. You know, local government finances are what they are. We're seeing the position 
you know, in, in the Midlands, you know, with Birmingham and, and the Section 114 notice that the council issued, you know, that are challenging local government finances. We're in a post-March 2020 world where people's ways of working and uh, priorities have changed and their work-life balances are being reassessed. We're dealing with a cost of living crisis nationally and obviously within the sector, we're dealing with two big challenges around workforce development and uh, retention of, of staff uh, and how people progress to, to where they want to be within the profession. But also, how do we advocate for and raise awareness of libraries? I think libraries are, you know, they're a universal service, free for all at the point of access. But what's our unique selling point and how do we make it clear to people that there is something for everyone in libraries? And that libraries may not be the answer to everything, but they're often part of the answer to some of the problems we're facing. So we need to do a lot more shouting about what libraries can do for people. Next slide, please. And inevitably with challenges, they become opportunities, you know, and we need to try and harness some of those opportunities that we've got as well. Um, you know, the devolution deals that are coming in local government, um, how do we um, position libraries to, to make the most of that, to secure some of the funding that is becoming available uh, locally? Um, and, and how do we make the most of those relationships at a local level? We can support multiple agendas. You know, the some people argue, you know, libraries should and are there uh, intrinsically for themselves. You know, providing books, providing computers, but actually, libraries can support multiple agendas around public health, business support, um, health and well-being, digital inclusion, uh, supporting the third sector, supporting wider um, local priorities. And, and there's an opportunity there for libraries to to deliver these, and they'll be really hyper local to their organisations. The social infrastructure of libraries, I don't think, can be undervalued. I mean, libraries are nothing without the people who use them and work in them and make them these living spaces that they are. But the buildings themselves, we've seen that the social infrastructure has real value to people in their communities, but also the communities that have good social infrastructure have better outcomes and better health outcomes, better prospects than those areas that don't. Libraries have got opportunities to, they have a much lower barrier to access than uh, big cultural institutions, business support centres, hospitals. So libraries have a real role to play in supporting health and well-being, but also business support. And we've seen this through the business and intellectual property centres who have supported a, num a large number of creative organisations and creative businesses. But they've, they've done this in a really um, sustainable way. And, you know, they're, they're supporting people uh, across the country and they're also generating significant levels of income in communities and return on investment. And back to that social infrastructure point, you know, libraries are anchor institutions in place. They're free to access front doors to council services and partners and free to use with no judgment and no, you know, prerequisites or prejudgment. And, there, and there's a key opportunity for partnership building as well. And particularly, you know, in the time I've been in Arts Council, those partnerships that libraries can build with, I think there is a real opportunity around this ecosystem of libraries, independent bookshops, publishers, authors, uh, the, you know, the book industry and libraries coming together to, to, to share the joy of reading, to share the joy of reading for pleasure, but also the, the, the better life opportunities and the improvements that, that reading can, that can provide for people. Uh, next slide, please. So my big takeaways from this is, well, you know, like I say, I've been really privileged to, to spend time traveling across the country, speaking to people, you know, people here who are doing the hard work, you know, that this job is, uh, uh it's there's a lot to it there's a lot to be involved but actually it's a real joy to do and i'm constantly in awe of the work that people do on a day-to-day -day basis to support their communities you know so libraries are at the heart of the communities they serve it's a hyper local offer down to you know within a couple of miles of that building where libraries are reactive and adaptive and responsive to the people that they support they have that low barrier to access that you know no judgment no need to spend anything come in spend time as much as you want there um, and, 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 and at no cost. And the, the libraries are full of empathetic, knowledgeable staff who, on a day-to-day -day basis, deal with some really challenging situations, uh, some people, you know, supporting people who are in crisis and delivering a real value and impactful service. But people don't know what libraries offer, and I think we've still got so much more to do to share about the great work that they do and how they can help support other people, support the communities they serve, and, and, and improve people's lives. Um, I can't, when I first came, we were trying to think of, you know, what's the, the pitch on libraries and 
the further, the closest or the most I could get was libraries make your lives better in some way, whatever that is. So I'm, I'm happy to help have that idea fleshed out. Um, and I think the last slide just might be my, my contact details. Um, and obviously I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you for listening to me ramble on about libraries. Oh, thank you so much, Luke. Um, that's been such a brilliant overview. And thank you so much for sharing the breadth of what the library delivery is, um, our priorities, the challenges, the opportunities. Um, there are a couple of questions. I wonder if we can um, just quickly uh, look at those from Anthony uh, Sprouse in regards to the digital infrastructure inclusion agenda. As many public libraries are often currently falling short of being able to offer new and emerging technologies, how do you see this developing in the next few years to be able to support new generations and to continue to upskill our communities? And I think it's a really important point on the upskilling. There's the upskilling communities and also upskilling staff. So there, there is a this isn't simply about putting nice new shiny bits of technology in buildings. There is something that we need to try and do at scale. And in Arts Council, we, we see ourselves having a role there. How do we at scale work with central government and local governments to look at what the infrastructure that is needed and then what is the training and support that is needed to use these technologies. They are an extension of the people's network and the digital inclusion work that libraries have done for, you know, 20 odd years. But there is there is a challenge around um, being able to offer access to the new and emerging technologies. And I think we have to build partnerships with academic institutions and the, and the private sector as well around how do we get this technology into the hands of people so they're not afraid of it and they can try it. So I suppose it's a long way, long winded way of saying, I think we as Arts Council need to look on a national level to build some at scale partnerships. Thank you. And Luke, um, an enormous question to end with, but I'm asking for a brief reply. Um, what role do you see AI playing in public libraries? And I'm assuming that's not an anonymous bot or something that's asked that question, but um, I think AI will have a role to in public libraries around helping with some things like data mining, understanding collections, cataloging, classifying. I think more importantly, the role that public libraries will have in AI is supporting people to be confident users and understanders of what it is when they're using it to be critical thinkers about it and to have a space to freely access it and understand it. And maybe by an extension of that, how can libraries support communities to take ownership of the of AI, build AI that is not biased and reflects the communities they are in. So I think there's a couple of opportunities for libraries there. Okay, well, um, we're going to finish the session now and say a huge thank you to Luke for, for joining us and for bringing to scope that first year of you in post. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you. So thank you very much, Luke. Thanks, Angela. Thanks again for the invite. Very welcome. Okay, and now in our first panel discussion of the afternoon, I'm delighted that we're focusing on author events from planning to promoting to hosting. And so to take a fully rounded view of this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by a publisher, an author and a librarian. Um, and I can see them appearing on my screen now. It's lovely to welcome Jess Barrett, Natalie Marlow and Amy Capewell. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. 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 Thanks. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, now we are actually inviting questions from attendees in this session. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A function as opposed to chat. Please say where you're watching from and then your question, who it's for, maybe it's for all of our panellists, and we'll select some of those to put to our guests. I'm going to start with Jess. Jess Barrett, welcome. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your role um, and how you currently work with public libraries in bringing authors to meet readers. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm Jess and I work at Simon & Schuster UK. Uh, we are a UK based publisher and I'm in the publicity team. So the publicists generally are the people who look after the author media, press and also their events. And that sometimes looks like book like bookshop events and festivals, but it also includes libraries. So um, we will often add in library events to supplement a book tour that might be sort of see an author getting out and about visiting their local bookshops and doing talks and then we'll look regionally at where that author is going to be and perhaps approach some of the libraries in that area to see if they can accommodate events alongside that so it, it does vary as to how um 
we approach libraries sometimes we do some digging and reach out ourselves we actually have a quite a good list of like contacts anyway that we've built up over the years as a publisher um sometimes it happens through social media but we are publish publicists are always really really keen to hear from librarians especially those who kind of have a specific author in mind that they think you know this is really going to connect with our with our library audience and what is the best way for a library to get in touch with a publicist at a publishing house? Um, I mean, generally by email. Um, so, but if they have a contact with perhaps the library, the way that they stock books might be through a publisher sales team and they can point you in the right direction. So anybody, publishers are friendly people, so they can always point you in the right direction of a, a publicist to reach out to. We, are, we all live on social media as well. So if you see a publisher that's talking about a book that you think looks fantastic, you could message that publisher on social media. Um, email's definitely best because that's where you can dig into sort of the conversation and get the ideas going. Um, yeah, email's best, I would say. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce now an author from the West Midlands. That's Natalie Marlow, who is a great friend of the Readers Network and a stalwart supporter of libraries. Um, author of the 1930s detective noir Needless Alley with a follow up coming up in the new year in March, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. And Natalie, would you like to share with us um, your own relationship with, love, with libraries, with public libraries and your experience of meeting readers through library based events? So uh, way before I was a writer, I was a reader and a reader in uh, Nuneaton Library, which is a, uh, a, actually I consider it a very beautiful little library in not such a beautiful little town <laughs> in North Warwickshire. Um, so uh, I, was a, I was a reader from childhood onwards using Nuneaton Library. So I have a, a real fondness uh, for libraries and a good chunk of Needless Alley was written in the Neaton Library as well. Um, it's only very recently obviously that I've been doing events in uh, libraries and that's simply because I was a baby this year. So I've done a, a, a wide range of events, uh, local bookshops, Waterstones, some very big kind of panels and big, big literary events in, in, the, in the prime writing world and obviously libraries. And um, my experience in libraries has been uh, overwhelmingly positive. Um, I think that's because most writers, what they want more than anything is to connect with readers. And, and you find readers in libraries. Um, librarians, again, um, uh, when, when a writer meets a librarian, you've met your tribe, you're with your tribe. So overall, the experience has been um, uh, incredibly positive. So I visited mostly libraries throughout the West Midlands. Um, the attendance at the events has been varied, but I'm, I'm a pretty pragmatic person. Um, uh, so I've had I've had sort of uh, a nice full libraries every now and again, and then I've had real two men and his dog events. But I think any any writer is pretty pragmatic over those kind of events, particularly debut writers. Um, but um, it's always a pleasure and a joy to meet with readers and talk with readers, particularly um, readers who are either enthusiastic about historical fiction or uh, the writing of place or crime. So that's sort of, you know, I write that stuff so it sort of encompasses that stuff. Lovely. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm glad you've had um, good experiences so far. And of course, with your second novel, they will still be knocking at your door asking <laughs> you to come to the library. So um, be prepared for plenty more invitations. And after today, I'm sure as well. Um, <laughs> I'm really delighted that Amy Capewell as well, Senior Librarian from Stoke-on-Trent Libraries, is also with us. And so could I please ask you, Amy, what you would say are the benefits to the library of hosting author visits? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, lovely to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I I love uh, welcoming authors into libraries. Uh, I've I've worked uh, in libraries for you know a substantial number of years now, and it's always the most delightful of sort of afternoons, evenings, or anything when we can welcome uh, a professional author uh, writer into into the libraries. It's it gives our our readers the opportunity to connect uh, through through the words on the page. So. It's, we often find that reading is that quite solitary uh, kind of 
uh, pastime. And this is a more social uh, kind of element way of getting people to connect. It, it almost goes back to what Luke was saying in that libraries can connect and, and it sort of it helps to promote that well-being feeling as well. So there's this very wide uh, kind of connection net, I think, that that bringing an author into libraries has. Uh, I know that, that we have the experience in the past that people will come to uh, author events for many, many different reasons. So whether that just be uh, because they, they've seen there's something on and they're, they're a bit nosy, they want to come. It's like joining a queue, isn't it, in Britain? We've seen, you know, you see a queue and you kind of want to join it. Uh, it could be that they, they enjoy uh, sort of reading that particular genre and they want to know more about that particular author. Uh, sometimes people will know the individual author and have have read uh, sort of things in the past um or you know sometimes and and from some of our more recent events we've had people who are sort of uh, undertaking some academic study and are using sort of elements uh, of that that author event to kind of feed into a, a study as well so there's there's lots of different reasons i think that that people come to these events uh, and the benefit for us is that we are bringing lots of different people into the library building uh, because people may not uh, kind of know that their local library is there. Sometimes some, some, sometimes some of our libraries are kind of tucked away. We know that a lot of our libraries have kind of moved or downsized a little in, in more recent years. And it kind of, it helps us to kind of promote what the library has, the library services, and that, that kind of uh, supportive or, or, you know, the, the kind of the world around that core offer of, of books and reading. Uh, it helps us to get a little bit of uh, awareness out there into our communities and say, come on in, this is this is more than what you think, more than that kind of sitcom view that people almost have of libraries of sort of those musty books and the shushing. Uh, and I, I do have to say, I've been shushed as a librarian more than I have shushed other people. Uh, always have to sort of throw that, to, that tidbit in. But yeah, so there's, it's just such a, a pleasure to welcome uh, sort of authors into libraries for so many different reasons. Thank you, Amy. And I think you sort of encapsulated the fact that author visits for libraries, the staff and the visitors as well, entertaining, educational, enjoyable. Um, and I think that's that's what we really love. And that's why we find it so rewarding. But we also know there is not a single model or a one shape fits all organising these author visits. Some libraries are able to go direct to the author to make arrangements. Others will firstly talk to the publisher, as Jess was talking so Jess, coming back to you, from your perspective, if a library is emailing you um, to ask about hosting an author event in their library, what are the key things the library will need to bear in mind when approaching the publisher to make that request? So we sometimes get libraries that approach us and, and they don't have a specific author in mind. They just say, hello, this is us. We're keen to do more. Let us know what you've got. And then we do sometimes have authors, um, who, or, sorry, libraries that come to us with a specific author in mind. So I think the, the one thing that I would stress across everything to do with, I think this is events generally, is just transparency and honesty. So if you are a library who is got a really successful up and running events program you've got quite a bankable for example crime fiction crowd you can say this is what we do this is the this is the author that we'd love to welcome you know perhaps we work with a local independent bookshop this is how we could get them involved as well and sort of lay out what you can offer and then the publisher can come back to you and say well that sounds good and how do you, what sort of audience would you expect and i think it's really good to lay out from the outset not just cross your fingers hope for the best and hope that people turn up but just say you know what actually we love this author we could do them a really wonderful event but it might be 20 people and if that's a debut author the publisher might turn around and say well that's fantastic because we're really trying to build this author's network they may they maybe they're not ready to do those big events yet or the publisher might turn around and say actually you know we are that author is very time poor we're trying to be selective and with the author with the events that we do and we're actually looking for libraries that can host maybe 60 to 70 people now and then it's okay I also think it's okay for libraries to turn back turn around and say do you know what perhaps we we can't do that for you then and you know maybe we'll come back and talk about something else because you know we know that events can be tricky getting people out cost of living crisis you know I think it's really good to just lay out from the beginning this is with the publisher these are these are our goals and if we exceed them then fantastic but um I think it's just quite good to 
be quite clear from the outset and say to the publisher, you know, would that author like to give a talk? Would they like to be interviewed? You know, sort of what's their what's their preferred setup? Um, and just, you know, be sort of ask all those questions at the outset to make sure that you as, you know, as the event provider can kind of make sure that author has a good experience. Yeah, yeah. So clear, realistic expectations and talk through what the format is what the expectations are from every perspective. I was going to bring that point up, actually. It's always worth checking if the author is happy to do a talk, a solo talk to the audience, or if they would prefer an in-conversation event, and for the mm. library to be able to arrange a well-prepared interviewer if required to do that. So um, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, Here, I just... Sorry, yeah. just to that point as well. I know some sometimes, you know, you might a library might not necessarily have somebody who feels very confident to do yeah. that interview. And that doesn't necessarily have to be kind of a literary masterpiece of a conversation. It can just be somebody who's got a few prompts that says, How did you get into writing? You know, is there any local angles that might appear to our audience? What are you doing next? Have you got any tips for up and coming authors? It doesn't necessarily have to be a deep, like dive into the themes of the book it can be it doesn't you know I think we are quite realistic as long as it's somebody who is you know interested in the book I think that's kind of our expectation thank you that's great Jess um now here at the Readers Network we do broker author visits and we work with libraries to find a suitable author to meet their needs and we offer those authors a fee um plus travel expenses as it's not necessarily part of a um a new book publicity tour um, and I know that differs across the board. So um, before I move on to Amy and Natalie, Jess, are you able to make a comment about that thorny topic of payment? I I can only speak for Simon and & Schuster. And I would not expect a library to pay an author to appear and um, or to contribute to expenses. I mean, what? I can the, the, the successful library events that we've done have generally been focused around the author's area of where they're based quite often they're happy to get in the car so actually the travel expenses or they get a taxi or a local train there's not much associated there so from a publisher's perspective that's fine to follow to swallow what I would say is where publishers are going to come into a little bit of a stumbling block is the actual book sales themselves it, that's where the author will see the value in the event so for example being able to go to an event it's okay if they don't get a fee but they would like to perhaps see some of their books being sold now that might only be a handful but it's the gesture of you know being able to see some yield from the event so some authors will take copies of their own book and sell them that way that isn't what we try to do we would always try and bring an external bookseller in to do that because it means that the books go through the usual sales channels um so that's the ideal scenario and that's that from my perspective that more than covers any question about a fee or um expenses okay yeah i mean one of the things that again the readers network does stipulate when we're doing the brokering is that the library does offer those books for sale uh, on the day, whether that's supplied through their own library supplier on a sale or return basis, or maybe a, lo a local bookshop partnership. And I hopefully this is answering one of the questions that's already come up in, in the Q&A, actually. Um, we appreciate that the book sales are key to why a writer is kind of out there doing events and meeting established and new readers. Amy, can I come back to you in a kind of like in the, the library setting and scenario? Can you tell us about your experience of arranging book stock for sale? Um, that might be handy to, to pass on some information to libraries who haven't done that yet. Yeah, no problem with that. Uh, so we've, uh, when, whenever we welcome uh, an author uh, to the library, uh, like you say, one of those things that we also we always look at is uh, how can we uh, sort of source uh, books for sale at that, that event. And uh, like Jess just said, sometimes um, a, a smaller or debut author will sometimes bring uh, sort of copies of their own, especially if if uh, if that author has perhaps not come through uh, one of the major publishers or is a self um, self published author. Quite often they'll they'll have those copies themselves. Um, more often than not, especially through West Midlands Reader Network uh, events, we will go to our local book stockist. Now um, you've got you know a couple of different options really so you, you know we we often use our local waterstones contact and uh, i will say from a, a library point of view you know go and make make friends with uh, your local booksellers um so we have a, a great sort of um uh, you know partnership really with our local waterstones branch uh, 
um, and more often than not, whenever they possibly can, uh, they will come into events and, and sell those uh, sell those books. It does work. It's quite handy in a way because uh, if a, a bookseller comes in and, and sells on on the night for you or on the day for you, that money almost doesn't have to come through uh, sort of library finances. So. As we know in libraries, you know, there's always those little tick boxes, there's always those sort of uh, financial returns that go back. So it helps in a way because the the author is is making those sort of sales, um, you know, which really helps them. Uh, but it, it's a bit easier uh, at the event for the libraries to actually make uh, to, to manage. Um, there's also independent booksellers as well out there. So, you know, really go and have a look and search for your, your independent booksellers as well. Well, um, so I know that here in Stoke, we've just had a, a new independent bookseller that started up. So we're going to be uh, making some some friends, hopefully some new friends there. Um, but uh, as you've already mentioned as well, sometimes uh, you just you can't use uh, those sort of external sellers for whatever reason. So um, an event that's coming up for us uh, with the West Midlands Reader Network, unfortunately, because it's in December, um, our local booksellers have said, unfortunately, we can't support that because it's a, it's a big selling time for them. They're busy. And, you know, it's understanding that everybody is kind of getting busy around these sort of big holiday seasons. Um, so we're going to actually get hold of those books, like you say, on a sale and return basis through our, our own library stockist. So it's uh, it's sort of having a chat with with whoever's sort of buying from the library perspective, get hold of those books. And again, it's part of understanding in a way who your audience will be. So knowing are you likely to get 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 people and buying accordingly, because over time, you know, you will you'll get to know who's going to buy or sort of how many units you, you might sort of sell at different events and also based on this kind of. Uh, the, you know who the author is as well so you know you might sell more for one event less for another and you know depending on what the unit price is per book so if you've got a, a quite a pricey hardback you, you are going to sell fewer of those depending you know as opposed to a you know a sort of a cheaper mass market kind of paperback uh, version as well but yeah always uh, always have that option for people out there it's, yeah. you know it's it's always part of the publicity as well I think so. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we're answering some of the questions that are popping up in, in the Q&A where people are saying, sadly, they don't have a local bookshop. I know that's very a place that there really isn't just a local bookshop. And, and, and it can be a rather time consuming process to work through through supplier. But um, I think these, as we say, we have highlighted the importance of the books being available for sale and signing um, at an author event. So um, what well, can I just on that point as well? Yes, yes. I think. I, again, just to stress the point of transparency, it could be that a publisher and an, or an author is OK with coming and giving a talk to a local group in the but in the knowledge that there might not be book sales there because they might they might people can always go off and purchase the books afterward. I think it's just if you don't let don't be put off by that. It's not the ideal scenario because obviously we always want to have books present at an event. But if you it, it's always worth an ask. But just being clear from the outset that that's your position. Thank you. Yeah, as you say, we're going back to that whole clear expectations between everyone involved is the best bet. Um, there's so many different elements of this topic. Um, the audience capacity will be dictated by the space that the library can provide and what time of day that space is available. Um, we know we've been working with a lot of um, daytime events as well with libraries lately. So um, that's about an author who's got that availability during during the daytime who might not be able to drive. So public transport is again, a very important issue of, of their, it being a well-connected library in terms of the transport systems. Um, another one is charging or free events. And we know this is an ongoing debate in libraries. Some have policies not to charge for all their events to be free. On the other hand, it's, it's seen as an important income stream or to help cover cost of the work undertaken to put on the event. Free events can be really tricky to manage. Uh, you get the drop-off rate, etc. cetera. Um, we always urge that the event has an online presence if possible and a link that can be shared to give more details, hopefully as a way for people to reserve tickets. And Natalie, I know that authors are usually really keen to help co-promote events. So can you tell us a bit about how you do that and how others do that and, and help the host library uh, spread the word? So uh, whether we like it or not, and I think Jess hinted at this, the publishing world sort of lives on Twitter. Um, uh, so, so I, actually, I've got a real, um, a, a really good example of this. So very recently, I was at Prime Festival in Harrogate. Uh, one of my readers came to see me, but couldn't get to the signing because she wanted to go to another event straight afterwards. She saw on Twitter I was in Starbridge Library just recently, came for the talk, 
came along with her hardback, explained that she couldn't get me to sign it in Harrogate, um, and we had a nice chat and I signed her book. And that's because she saw the event being advertised on Twitter. I tweeted it, I tweeted about the event. Um, uh, so um, I think um, most writers, the vast majority of writers are very, very comfortable. We learn pretty quickly that we have to um, sell ourselves somewhat on social media. Um, and uh, so most of us are very, very comfortable with Twitter. And some of us are kind of flirting with Instagram and uh, other platforms. But Twitter tends to be the kind of um, the industry norm. So <clears throat> if I... Um, if I'm kindly provided with a graphic from a library, I'm more than happy to uh, tweet about the event, retweet the event, remind readers about the event as the time comes closer, um, because it's it's within my interest uh, as a writer to get as many um, thumbs on and retweets as possible, not necessarily to sell books. I mean, this is really interesting. I was really interested in, in hearing what you're talking about selling books. For me, it's more about connecting with readers, which is not as airy fairy as it sounds. Um, so uh, I'm a I'm a debut writer, and for me, it's about establishing a relationship with readers that will continue for the next ten, hopefully, fifteen years, because I'm writing a series. So for me, it's about connection with my reader, um, understanding what readers want. From a writer because I'm kind of uh, learning about events um, so it's about connection how um, uh, how these um, how these interactions with readers you know go what kind of people tend to turn up at these events these are things I'm really learning about and these are things that are really of use to me as a writer I'm also very keen for readers to um, close your ears all, all people in publishing get the book from the library you know so I, I i have a kind of personal interest in making sure that my book is in libraries and that people are getting it out of the libraries not so i can get necessarily the income stream that comes from that but again it's about my name it's about being out there being known uh so it's a kind of a, a, a sort of holistic thing I want to stress that this is for me personally. So if I go to an event and I don't sell a book, I'm perfectly happy. But what I do want, ideally, is a reasonable amount of people there so I can sort of build up a connection with the readership. And social media is the best way to do that. Um, if librarians are uh, happy to tweet like crazy, that really does make a difference to the event. Because you will get um, a kind of, you will get, for example, you will get that, um, that woman I spoke to who would have perhaps gone to a bookshop. So I'm doing a few bookshop events coming up, but she decided that Starbridge was local and she would come to that one. And she saw that on Twitter. So it's more of a, less of a kind of, um, there's a kind of crossover there between the, 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 the people that would more naturally go to a bookshop event coming to that library event. Um, so, and, and I think that's where social media came in. The, so this, this uh, the woman I was chatting with was a book blogger and um, a very keen reader. So, um, so, so that I found that quite interesting. That is interesting, the crossover. And I think the ripple mm. effect as well from library events of so the person who might not be able to buy on the day, but that book, your name is planted in their mind. They might buy it or borrow it later on down the line and we know from research that book buyers and book borrowers are not different breeds. yes absolutely it's and interchangeable yeah yeah and they, they might not necessarily buy new to sally but they might buy the second one or the third one in the series because oh i saw her a couple of years ago and she was quite interesting or, yeah, or whatever yeah so it's it's sort of long term these library visits for me and also it's a pleasure it's a pleasure Thank you. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you, all three of you this afternoon. And I can't believe our half an hour has already sped by. There are so many parts of it to, to talk about, isn't there? Um, but thank you so much uh, for your generosity, sharing your insights with us. It's been wonderful to have the opportunity of all three of us, you know, the perspective, the round view, really. Um, so we hope as well we've answered your questions from the Q&A um, and saying that... Um, 
today has hopefully given you plenty of useful pointers out there in libraries for um, talking to publishers, talking to authors and promoting your events. Um, thank you so much again to our guests, uh, to Jess, Natalie and Amy. You are free to go. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having thank us. You. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, that's been wonderful. Thank you so much. But then we're going to move on now to another of our presentations this afternoon. And I am very happy to welcome a highly recommended speaker, uh, Naomi Korn, who is a copyright expert, who will be leading us through the topic, especially in relation to libraries sharing literature with readers. So welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this afternoon, Naomi. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me in. I've been really enjoying what I've listened to so far as well. It's lovely to hear. And I'm going to now come off screen, pass over to you. Uh, we'll have your presentation and my colleague will help you pass those slides on. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks so much. So it's lovely to um, to meet you all online. And um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about copyright. I know it's an area that um, people are very worried about. And so what I've put together is a short presentation summarizing what copyright is, and then looking at four key areas with regards to public libraries and copyright issues. I've got about 20 minutes in totalis, and so I'm going to leave some time at the end for Q&A. So please do get those um, questions um, ready to ask, and I'll do my best to cover as many as I can at the end. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the title of my talk today is Sharing is Caring, Navigating Copyright Issues for Public Librarians. Um, and the next slide, please. Just a, a few words. Um, you are welcome to use our presentations um, for your non-commercial research or private study purposes. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'll tell you more about myself in a moment. Um, but um, I hope that this will certainly update you about best practice activities in public libraries. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm privileged to head up a company called Nomicon Associates. Um, I now have um, six other members of my team and uh, we provide across the UK's public sector support for our colleagues in two of the, I would say, two of the most complex areas, copyright and data protection. We celebrate our 20th year anniversary this year and so much of what we do is to support our colleagues no matter what it takes. Now that's not just about buying services that we might offer or training courses, we do a lot that you can engage with that's available for free. So please do jump on our website. And if you go to the resources part of our website, you'll find a wealth of content that you can download, you can engage with, and you can use freely. They're available under, thank you, Emma, they're available under an open license. And it's really important to us. We're all, all of my team come from the public sector. My own background, um, very briefly, I trained as an archaeologist, um, worked for five years as an assistant curator of prehistoric archaeology, moved into copyright. Then I worked at Tate as their copyright officer for a few years before setting up on my own. And this is a sector I love and all of us, all of my team, um, believe that we can make a difference in terms of removing some of that panic and that fear, particularly about copyright um, that I'm going to be covering today. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I said, though, these are the key areas I'll be covering. Um, copyright is a dense subject. I certainly am not able to cover everything you ever wanted to know in 20 minutes about copyright. But what I'll do is I'll hopefully raise your awarenesses and also present to you some of the key solutions with regards to the complexity within a public library setting regarding copyright. Um, and more than that, what I'm hoping and what I'm expecting is that this will help you to understand the right questions you should be asking or indeed the red flags. And at the end of my presentation, there's some resources that you may wish to go to. These are free resources that will help you perhaps answer some of the questions that you've asked yourself. So this is about managing your expectations today. Right, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So I wanted to give you a sort of a short overview of copyright to start with and just really maybe remind you that copyright's really, really old. Um, it didn't come from um, creators at core. Copyright actually was instigated by publishers on the back of the Industrial Revolution. And they wanted to make sure that there was a more uniform protection in the UK for the outputs um, of the um, 
advances in developing the printing presses. So the Statute of Anne of 1709 was really the first piece of legislation in the world that outlines copyright, um, a much more reduced protection that we have to, than we have today. Um, but this is the start. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, today, we have the 1988 Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which is our primary piece of legislation. This outlines um, what copyright's about, what it protects, and I'll summarise that, that for you very soon. Um, it also provides within the legislation certain balances to rights holders' exclusive rights within the frame of exceptions to copyright. And these are important that we know about them within the setting of the work of librarians and information professionals. Now, there have been updates since 1988 and also um, since 1709, there have been also previous pieces of legislation. But for you right here, right now, this is the one that I want you to be familiar with. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So what does copyright say? What does it outline? Well, copyright is a very interesting right because although it came from the publisher's sort of desire and need to protect the printed word, it's an automatic right. It doesn't require registration. It's about actually a level of egalitarianism in terms that copyright doesn't discriminate between who you are. In, but the key point is that what you have produced is original. It's your own intellectual creation. And if you've done that, and that what you've created falls within at least one category of the different types of works that copyright protects, then you as a creator of that work, of course, it's different if you're a member of staff, it's your employer that would own the copyright in that instance. But if it's you working on behalf of yourself, you create an original work, then you have the copyright, the right to control subsequent copying. You also have the right to grant other people those permissions to reproduce your work. That's what copyright is. It's a right to copy. One of the benefits of being the copyright holder is that you can also commercially benefit from anybody else's copying of your work. So a core, it's interesting. Now you'll note in the tick list that I produced for you, the communication to the public, and we will be relating to this one within the guise of the case studies, but communication to the public is putting something online. If you put something online that's not your copyright, then you need to seek consent. Now, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, and what I'm going to just quickly show for you, and I'm, I'm um, very grateful for the, um, the finger pushing at the other end of these slides, thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly um, illustrate for you the different types of works that copyright protects. So can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so copyright protects visual works, musical works, films, text-based works, works that can be performed, arrangement, which could be words on a page, and recordings of sound. We also have broadcasts protected by copyright. Within the UK's copyright legislation, these are the eight categories of works that copyright protects. It's important because it shows you what's in copyright, but also what's out of copyright. Also within the space of um, books, journals, e-content, because copyright protects digital content in the same way as analog. It also, I think, quite neatly demonstrates that often, works that you may wish to reproduce might have multiple layers of rights. For example, a book can have copyright in the text, so that's the literary work, copyright in any images, including the cover, and also copyright in the layout. So for example, even a relatively recent edition of a work that's out of copyright, such as a recent edition of anything by Jane Austen, will still be in copyright by virtue of the fact that the layout will be the publisher's copyright, the typographic arrangement. And that will typically last, as you'll see from the next slide, for 25 years from publication. So the next slide, please. OK, so standard duration of copyright, many of you will know this, is lifetime plus 70 years. Can we have the next slide, please? But I'm going to show you that it does vary according to the category of work. So I've already referenced the lifetime plus 70 years. And I've referenced that typographic arrangements have 25 years from publication. But if we could have the next slide, please. Can we have the next slide and the next slide and the next slide and the next slide? So this is a neat way of illustrating that copyright varies not only according to the type of work, but also there are some, some anomalies with regards to works that have been created for on behalf of the crown. So we call these crown copyright works, where the duration of copyright is typically 50 years 
from creation if published and 125 years if unpublished. I think this is a useful slide as well and will provide a, a nicer segue into our next section when I give you some specific examples of copying in a public library setting um, to show you the different types of works that copyright protects, the range of works that copyright protects, effectively almost an audit map for you to think about post this presentation. So can we have the next slide, please? So the first scenario I wanted to talk about um, that will be common in a public library or indeed any type of library is a, when a member of the public comes in and makes a copy themselves. Now it might be that they make a copy of something that you have um, in your library. It might be a newspaper, it could be a, um, an article in a publication, it might be part of a book, it might be part of a map. They'll use, they potentially will use a device that they may have themselves. It could be a camera, it could be their phone, it could be an iPad, but indeed they might be also using devices that you have there for them. So that could be a photocopier machine or that, that could be a scanner. And I want to be clear that in this situation, in as much as there is an expectation that you as a public library will have clear notices and signage explaining to them what can be copied or how much can be copied, Ultimately, it's the user's responsibility to make sure that they copy within the framework of the legislation. So what does this mean on a day-to-day -day basis for you? It means that if you have any machines that can be used, equipment that can be used by members of the public, for them to make their own copies of um, items that you have in your collections, across your collections, then you need to have some kind of signage up um, to explain that, for example, they're able to make a copy, a single copy of a limited amount for their own non-commercial research or private study purposes. That's going to be essential. Some of you might also want to reflect that type of wording in any agreements you have with your readers when they perhaps sign up for readers' passes. So in as much as it's not your role to police that type of copying by your users, it's important that, as I said, you make it clear to them that it's their responsibility to make copies within the frame of the legislation, but also if you become aware of copying that's taking place that's beyond what the legislation facilitates, i.e. someone's copying perhaps a whole book that's in copyright, which is not allowed, then it would be your responsibility to make sure that you have some kind of perhaps policy framework that whilst alerting them to the potential infringement of what they're doing also protects you and keeps you safe as someone working in a public, li public library setting. Could we have our next slide, please? Thank you. The next type of copying that's likely to pay take place in a public library setting is, and I've used this as a generic term, but I'll explain more, photocopying, scanning, or copying by you as librarians for members of the public. Now, because you are copying on behalf of members of the public, it is your responsibility to make sure that they understand that you can um, provide them with a copy, but they can only use that copy for their non-commercial research or private study purposes. Now, typically what we would expect is that before the copying takes place, you will require them to sign a declaration in writing. Since 2014, the year 2014, the legislation has changed. Now, some of you who've perhaps been working in this field for some time, may be used to using forms. Now, in fact, because of the changes to the legislation, the copying that you do on behalf of your users doesn't need to be supported by the signature on a physical form, but does need a declaration to be signed in writing. So this, for example, could be done electronically, or indeed you could even provide them or service the request end to end. So they're requesting from you digitally, you're asking them to sign um, the declaration in writing digitally, and then you're supplying them digitally with the copy that they require. So this is different. It's related to the previous example we discussed, but here it's important to protect yourselves to get the declaration in writing and to make sure you hold on to that for up to seven years. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is a question that we're asked a lot. So what about um, book reading sessions in your library space? Are those um, eligible to be uploaded onto social media sites? So at core, um, the message that I'd like to communicate and perhaps relating back to the slide about copyright and these exclusive rights given to rights holders is that 
certainly within the frame of reading books or book reading sessions, I wouldn't anticipate that there are any issues with that. The issue becomes pertinent when those readings are being recorded and shared on social media platforms. There are several reasons for this. First of all, the social media platforms themselves contain detailed terms and conditions which place the onus of responsibility on you as a representative of your organization in posting that recording to make sure that any recordings are legal, appropriate, not offensive. That would include making sure that you have permissions from the rights holders to upload any recordings of you reading from works that may still be in copyright. So that's the first reason. The second reason is the communication to the public um, right that I explained very early on in this presentation to ensure that any reproduction of in copyright works on the web is done so with the rights holders permission. So in other words, if you are um, recording and sharing readings of works that are not in copyright, then I would suggest that there will be very few issues, if any. But the general saying that we say in my field is it depends on what your um, what you're reading. If it's a work that's in copyright, then it's about caution with regards to sharing. And so in this respect, whilst we like to think that sharing is caring, it can present risks for you if you don't have permission from the rights holders. Now that might also include the publishers as well. So the fourth one, please. Thank you. Sharing book covers online. Um, Perhaps of all the um, questions I've been asked in my career, this is the question that I'm asked most. So within a public library setting, if there is a particular author that you're profiling, if there are um, new works in your library, maybe new additions, and you wish to engage and communicate with members of the public, and I agree that it's a really important um, medium for, ex for certainly extending the relationship between public libraries and readers and authors and readers as well. Um, not all book covers are the same and not all book covers can be shared online for very similar reasons to those that I um, stipulated in the previous slides. And of course, all of this is about, in many respects, is about risk. So I could also use the term rather than say, I don't think it's advisable. I could also say something like this is high risk. OK, and I think you probably know what I mean. Sharing book covers online depends on what the book cover is. So in some instances, the publishers themselves do not own the rights in the book cover. Maybe they have um, got permission perhaps from a stock photography agency to use a particular image on the front of their book. Therefore, putting that book cover online, particularly on social media, will present challenges and risks for you as a person posting it. Because, because in as much as you may be promoting the author, you may be infringing the rights in that image cover. Perhaps the publisher themselves hasn't got permission for it to be sh um, shared on social media. And as I said earlier, the terms and conditions of that license with social media may um, not only put the onus of responsibility on you to ensure that what you are sharing is legal, but an additional issue is that the the um, uploader's terms and conditions with social media mean that if you do upload content on a social media platform, you, you effectively grant a license to that social media platform to use the content that you've uploaded in whatever way they want. So if you don't have the rights in the first place, there's a bit of a double whammy there. So sharing book covers online, again, depends. It depends on what it is. If it's an old book cover, or if it's just a title and the name of a book, I would say that's probably okay. But if it's a more contemporary book cover, that's got an image on the front. If it's clear that the um, publisher doesn't own the rights in the image, but they the image has been licensed to the publisher, then I think that there is greater risk if you were to share that online. Nothing is straightforward in copyright. And as I said, we often say it depends and context is everything. So the answer, particularly for the last two scenarios, is not an outright no. It's It depends on what you're reading. It depends on what you're sharing. And to keep yourself safe is to sometimes err on the side of caution and to understand that this isn't just through the prism of copyright. This is also about understanding the terms and conditions of social media platforms, which are incredibly permissive to the social media platforms to reuse what you've posted. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm coming to the end of this presentation um, and I wanted just to sort of establish a few things for you. So um, make it easy for everyone to do the right thing. So signage, posters, um, terms and conditions for your readers and also your staff is important. 
um, make sure you get your declarations in writing. Um, please remember that however brilliant social media platforms are, um, it's providing an opportunity for anyone to gain access to any anyone else, anything, anytime, there is a cost and the cost effectively are the terms and conditions you're signing up to and the subsequent license and legal undertakings you're granting to that social media um, platform provider. Please reach out to your publishers, just double check. In many cases, I'm sure they'll say, yes, it's fine, but do ask, maybe they themselves have got something else planned and want to make sure that what you're doing um, either dovetails with what they're doing or maybe doesn't clash with what they're doing. And finally, listen to your gut. Um, intuitively, we will generally know what's right and wrong. And if it feels that it's not quite right and doesn't quite sit easily with you, what you're planning to do, then you're probably right. And this is your opportunity to ask the right question. Ask yourselves the right question. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, before we move on to questions, I just wanted to flag up some of the resources that I, that I mentioned to you um, would be available. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, the Intellectual Property Office is um, the part of government that oversees intellectual property rights as well as copyright. Um, that's, a, that's really good for a general overview of intellectual property rights. Um, but what I would really recommend as a super resource is a site called copyrightuser.org. Now, the, the guys at Glasgow University and Bournemouth University have put together this site. It's full of fantastic resources, helping everyone and anyone to understand what copyright means, particularly from the user of a copyright's perspective. So there's lots there about um, the exceptions to copyright that I mentioned and also copyright in a library or a museum context. Um, there are webs, uh, web videos as well and games that can be downloaded for free under an open license. So um, I'm very happy to take any questions that there may be time for. So thank you so much for listening and I hope this has been helpful. Lovely. Thank you very much, Naomi. I mean, more than helpful, uh, extraordinarily informative and has raised quite a few questions. But I feel the two websites you mentioned will hopefully answer some of them very quickly before we move on, because we do need to move on. There were a couple of questions which I can bundle into one. Uh, it was about whether libraries were safe to share, for instance, photographs of library uh, displays of books in libraries, obviously featuring uh, copyrighted images. And similarly, whether libraries were free to share with the permission of the people photographed pictures, photographs of people in their libraries reading books, which may themselves have covers in copyright. Are you able to quickly answer those uh, questions? Sure. So um, there is an exception. Thank you. And thank you for your very kind comments. Um, there is an exception of incidental inclusion, which you will find noted on the copyright user website, whereby if you can't quite make out what something is, then you can include it. So I would say that it depends on the photograph. It depends on what the, the um, emphasis is, uh, what, what it's uh, focused on, that it might be possible a long shot of library books. Um, that would be perfect. So I think that's probably fine. Um, the second question is about photographs of people. I would say that the greatest risk there is not so much what they're reading, but actually the privacy rights associated with taking photographs of members of the public that are identifiable. And indeed, this is perhaps where there's the additional layer of complexity between um, understanding where copyright begins and ends and where data protection begins and ends as well. And often in our worlds, the two, um, we find the two together. So I would say be cautious about taking photographs of people, particularly if you can identify the people in those photographs. Yeah, okay, people. that's... yeah. Thank you. I and mean, that's really sound advice. And and uh, I, I know lots of libraries that are aware of the the uh, requirements of taking photographs of people in the public domain and obviously especially young people. Um, we do have to draw your presentation to a close at this point. As I said, really informative, uh, thrown lots of ideas into my mind, certainly. Thank you for those two links. And also we have passed on to everybody your website so they can go and find out more about your work and may have cause to, to use your services going forward. So uh, I'll let you see yourself out. Safe journey home. Uh, and we'll welcome our next speaker in a moment. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. So um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next session. Uh, this is about Ask for a Book, an Arts Council England funded project developed by Opening the Book. In a few minutes, we will welcome Anita Kiss from Worcestershire Libraries, who will talk about piloting the project in their libraries. But first, to tell us more about Ask for a Book, I'm delighted to welcome on screen, she's just appeared here, the founder of Opening the Book, Rachel Van Reel. I'm going to disappear from the screen for a moment, Rachel, because I know that you're going to uh, give us a short presentation. And when we return, both Anita and I will 
will uh, be in conversation along with you about the project. So um, over to you, Rachel. I think we should have the first slide on the screen. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thanks for the invitation. And um, we'll take questions when I've run through this presentation because Anita's here from Worcestershire, that's great. So you'll hear something about it on the ground as well. I just wanna start with getting you all to think about how do you choose what to read next? You know, there's so many books out there, you can become overwhelmed. You know, maybe you're very dedicated, you look at all the reviews, maybe you've got particular authors you always follow, but then you end up always reading the same kind of thing. I know I do that a bit. Um, lots of us get suggestions and we get suggestions from friends, from colleagues, from family, from people we trust. Could libraries do that? You know, can we step in and be the best friend who knows what you like, but can find you something you didn't know about. How might we do that? Now, some staff, there are probably some of you on this call, have been doing that for years. That's what you do in your library job. But it's a bit hit and miss. And most of us in libraries have got less time to do it than used to be. So, you know, is there a way we could step up and offer something particularly digitally that would work? So that's what Ask for a Book is. It's a website to deliver trusted recommendations to readers from their local library. It's not tell us about a book, it's for people who actually want to be, have a suggestion uh, given to them. And it's a two year pilot and we're uh, about three quarters of the way through the second year. Um, next slide. I won't read out all the text on the slide, you can use those. Um, people who want a suggestion from someone they trust. Sorry, I'm just getting interference on sound here. Are you able to mute that? We've got a fire alarm going off, would you believe? <laughs> so I hope that that's not too annoying. So people who want a suggestion, anyone who wants a quick, easy way. Hold on, I'm just going to chase. Can you turn the fire alarm off? I, I think actually, Rachel, we, we can't hear it. Um, uh, the people can you, are... Jonathan, can you hear our fire alarm? We can't hear it. We can't even hear the crackling oh, of the perfect. flames. You can't hear it. I will carry on. Uh, it's a very, it's Don't a, it's worry. a, it's a very small a sound. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll live with it. So the we'll live with it. people that we think might like this site. Um, there are people who don't read much and give up because they're not sure where to start. There's also keen readers who can get stuck in a rut. I think there are a lot of people who would like an alternative to getting books from Amazon for all kinds of reasons. Um, I think there are a lot of people who haven't been to libraries in years and they think that we haven't got books that will interest them. They're not right. Every library's got books. But, you know, how do we persuade them that we have a quality offer? Next slide. So you all know that libraries do good displays now. We know this is how people choose in physical libraries. We have a huge number of customer interviews that library staff have carried out on our courses and what it shows every time is that people choose from displays that's great but what's the digital equivalent a lot of library websites are part of a bigger council website so it's very transactional it's all about you know finding out what your bin day is it's not going to give you a lot of good reading advice even library catalogues they're getting better all the time but they're not great at giving advice they're much better when you want to search for something specific so what's the digital equivalent to those fabulous displays that i'm showing you there next slide this is the home page of ask for a book and i hope you're all going to go and sign, try it out um get hand-picked recommendations from your local library next slide it's very simple we're going to show you things that help you tell us what you like, but it's a different way. We're not showing the classic genres, crime, fantasy. We're going to show you book covers and see what your instinctive reaction is to those. And instead of subjects, the standard classification, we're going to show you intriguing themes. And then real library people will use their expertise to email you recommendations that match your preferences. And then you can go and pick up the books. Next slide, please. So this is how you choose and you can scroll through covers or themes. There's lots of them to pick from. One of the things that will become apparent is that this is quite a tricky thing for libraries to do, because if everybody wants the same book, and particularly if it's a popular one, you're not going to have enough copies of it. So you've got to widen the choice. So this is giving us an idea of what you like. And it's a lot of fun. You just whiz through. Keep going. There's covers. I've ticked one I like. Next slide. 
Here's a typical theme, conspiracies, plots, and secrets dissected. Next slide. And here's another one, which is a cover. And when I click the third one, the three come up there. Our suggestions for you will be based on these three choices. You can change your mind, go for something else. Then you pick the library where you're going to pick them up. And then you click, ask for suggestions, bingo, off it goes. Next slide, please. Now, this is the secret bit that the user doesn't see. This is the back office, which the library staff manage, okay? So in here, um, Worcestershire, for instance, can go in and pick up any new requests. So you can see new there, request from Rachel Van Reel to collect from. They click on view to see that request. If we can go to the next slide. Okay, the cover the reader selected is shown on the left and next to it is a whole collection of books that make sense. This collection is actually called Millennial Relationships and the book picker can pick from any one of those. They're pre-selected. We've actually got a lot of collections now, 57 different ones, two new ones are added each month. Library staff have taken a course to learn the skills of curating collections. And um, Anita may tell you, three of Worcestershire's staff have actually got, one's gone live now, queer experience, two more are coming up in the future. So it's really interesting, but they're quite small, tight, curated, connected collections. Let's go to the next slide. So what happens is the book picker picks on one of these books. So here they've picked an American marriage and immediately, this is the technical side, that cover and a little message, we call it the me to you message. It's a message, a personal message. I've chosen this book for you because it delivers an intimate portrait of a young African-American couple whose lives are upended by an act of racial injustice. Their love story is so beautiful and poignant, it will squeeze your heart and haunt your days. So we have a message which is not quite a um, review, but it's a temptation, it's a promotional piece of writing. And selecting that title, immediately you get the cover and the message. Next slide. Here's the same again for the speculative one. And here I've picked the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. If one of our partners, was to show it's taken example, doesn't have all these books, it will be greyed out and they can't choose it. So we know that this book is in the catalogue, which is great. Keep going. Next slide, please. And the third one. This one is another cover collection that's just gone live, which one of the people on the course did called Dark Academia. And um, you can see Wilder Girls come, comes up there. So we have the three books there that are going to be the three suggestions. We know those books are available in the catalogue. The book picker will have to check the LMS to see whether they're actually available for somebody to borrow. But if they are, they'll reserve them and get that moving. Um, if you want the details, Anita can tell you more about that. But you can see that actually there's quite a lot of books to choose from there. They're not all going to be driven to the Atlas Six, which is a very popular title. We can take them in different directions. Uh, the ones marked W are deliberately widening the choice. Next slide, please. So what then happens is you click customize the email and all of this is automated. The three books and their meet you messages flow automatically with a really nice little message. Hello, Rachel. Thanks for sending me an idea of the kind of books you're looking for today. I've used your choices to pick these books for you. I hope you'll be tempted to give them a try. And then you get the little promotional message about each of the books. We'll let you know when your books are ready to be picked up at XX Library. And we'll hold the books there for you for 14 days. I hope there's something in this selection you enjoy. Do come back and make another request when you get stuck for a good read. There's then a text box that the book picker can write something personal in. This is to feel personal. We want it to feel, we're using technology um, to help um, get across that libraries have this knowledge, they have this expertise, they've created these collections. So the whole thing feels personal, but you can actually add another message as well. You then click on send the email and let's go to the next slide. And this is how the email appears on a phone. The entire site works on mobile phones because that's what people mostly have. It'll work on desktops, laptops, lap tablets as well. But you can imagine the design is driven by the mobile phone. So that image on the left is one long scroll as it comes up on your mobile phone. And it's split on the three uh, images to the right to show you what that looks like altogether. So that's a tempting 
email to tell you what we're suggesting for you. And most services will get that to you. You get an acknowledgement straight away when you put in your request, but they'll mostly get you the suggestions within two days. Then it might take a bit longer to get the actual books. Next slide, please. The actual books, we've got some marketing materials, digital ones too, but this is actually how it might look. You can see it behind me. Uh, you know, the request that we all have that people wrap things in. Um, we've done an ask request, so it is a bit more visible in the library. Next slide. And here's just a few comments from readers who've used it. We've had tremendous feedback. People do love it. Well, um, Rachel, sorry to, cut in, sorry to cut in here, Rachel, but um, uh, maybe we need to just come to the opportunity to talk to Anita at okay. this point. I don't know and how I many slides you've got. I'm nearly at the last slide. Nearly at the last so, one, good. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is the um, last two slides. Okay, far away. Out. Some nice quotes. Next slide, two quotes, uh, which is about people starting things. Just go to the next slide. And the last slide is just a summary of what it's doing in terms of linking online and physical uh, libraries and taking people to books that maybe they don't know about and using stock that libraries might otherwise not get out there. And that's it, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, you thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for my colleagues sharing the slides. And welcome on screen, uh, Anita, who can now unmute herself. Um, we've had a you, very Jeff. interesting presentation. Hello. Very interesting presentation Hello. from uh, Rachel. Um, we'd love to hear about your experiences in Worcestershire Libraries with this scheme. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Rachel, for that uh, presentation. That was lovely. Um, yes, we've had a fantastic experience with Ask for a Book, to be completely honest. It's so um, great to be able to offer something new and exciting to the reader, but using resources that we've already got in-house. Um, and I think the, my favorite thing about this project has been and is the fact that it's engaged staff with our core offer once again, because we know in libraries very often we get caught up in, you know, um, requests for blue badges, all sorts of things that we do that kind of move us sort of further away from talking to people about books and recommending books. But actually, piloting this service in libraries has has kind of brought us back to looking looking at reading habits looking at what people prefer um and 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 talking to colleagues about books that that we choose that we like um and things that we've picked for customers that have been um you know some we've we've had some really fantastic uh, choices with great feedback from customers That's lovely well i was passing ask a little more about customer feedback because um uh, obviously this to us as people in the literature writing library world this feels like a wonderful scheme we'd all like to be involved in it how have members of the public responded to what is quite an unusual offer can you say a bit about that i wouldn't say it's really unusual it's very easy for them for them to use and i think that's been the main thing that people have said um we have had feedback from from people saying that they didn't like the recommendations that we've put forward to them which is absolutely fine because it's a free service and you can get books that you don't like <laughs> it's not yeah. you know um so we've encouraged customers to, to come back and, and and try the service again and we have had a few repeat customers which i think speaks volumes of uh the service and the fact that that people have enjoyed um getting the recommendations and and going for a lucky dip sometimes you know every now and again you might you might want to have a go it's something that um that you um you've not tried before so yeah brave readers <laughs> good good uh, rachel a very technical question for you um does it is it a system for avoiding having a book recommended to you twice does it does it yes. record what you've already read yeah yes that's automatic if somebody's already had it it'll come up saying not. And there's also an option to allow the staff, if they have time to check what you've already borrowed anyway from the library and not recommend that as well. Okay, that's that's a great answer. And, and in terms of the future of it, uh, Anita, Anita, from your point of view in Worcestershire, um, is, is it something which you, you, know, you feel you'd like to roll out funds permitting, et cetera? We would. Um, we've been very cautious in rolling it out, and we've gone. We've got twenty-one libraries within our authority, and we've gone sort of library by library, mm -hmm. um, just because we were afraid that we would get overwhelmed with requests that we wouldn't be able to satisfy. But that's not been the case. It's been nice and steady, uh, and I think we we would definitely like to continue offering it to the 
to the wider audience just because um just because of the kind of a variety of books that it showcases it, it kind of you can pick little gems that of, of books that people don't really come across whilst browsing the shelves and you can just highlight those gems to them um there's a lot of scope uh with with um as for a book you can use it as display inspiration as well we've found many other kind of ways in which we can use it and, and engage with our readers you do get sort of uh data which is one thing that i think we struggle in in libraries sometimes kind of um gathering data about um, habits and sort of uh, interests from our, from our readers, um, and I think it's it's really helped. We've seen, we've learned about reading habits and topics that people are interested in just by looking at the ask curator side of the um, website. That Rachel hasn't kind of she hasn't shown you everything. There is there is yet <laughs> another layer to that, um, which is where you can see how many users, how how many people have used your service, how many people have uh, the kinds of things that pe people click on that they're interested on in. And um, if, just to give you an example, in one of our libraries, um, the, most of the borrowers have chosen past times, and we were we were really shocked that that so people were really interested in sort of non-fiction historical kind of um, books and and that's a great way of kind of bringing more of those kinds of books to the audience putting displays about uh, up that kind of um meet the re requirements of the community and kind of moving your stock around and just using your resources more smartly so that's been an excellent tool for that w wonderful wonderful i mean i'll finish with a final question uh, to rachel it sounds rachel like this is a very interesting way of both both um creating demand but also satisfying demand at the same time uh what what would be the immediate future be for this this program can you see it being extended that's, that's a nice phrase jonathan i'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna steal that. Creating that and satisfying is lovely um we are looking to expand so if you're interested in being part of the next stage from april 24 we'll be looking for new partners we're looking at different levels of engagement there's a steering group i won't go into the governance and the funding but it's all there if you want to just have a go now to try it out um, um, or in the next few weeks, if you're in Worcestershire, Staffs, Coventry in the West Midlands, they're all participating. Some of you from other places. If when you get the drop down list of library services, yours is not listed, we only have 15. We still have the completely fictitious opening the book libraries because um, that's useful to test and demo. If you pick that one, you will get the whole service, but you won't be able to go and get the books because opening the book libraries doesn't exist. <laughs> but you can try it using that. And, you can, and we love feedback. The more people, you know, try it out and give us feedback, the better. But Worcestershire have been fantastic in the way that they've rolled it out. And I think they could do a whole presentation for you, Jonathan, on data driven marketing. They are the best I've come across on that okay well that's that's lovely uh we all blush here or certainly anita does at such praise thank you um i'm going to thank both our speakers uh particularly rachel for not fleeing a burning building but staying <laughs> because it was a false alarm i'm i'm happy to say to everybody watching but uh, rachel was not risking life or limb uh but when she finds out who set off the alarm they might be suffering some life and limb risk uh thank you both for your presentations i wish you a very good afternoon and i'll introduce our next session thank you jonathan bye thank for now you. So um, now to our final panel session, um, uh, featuring two writers whose books might well feature uh, in the session we've just had. Um, and after this panel session, we're going to have a little uh, short session just reflecting on what we've all learned this afternoon. But for this final session, uh, we'll hear about a project of the West Midlands Readers Network. It's called New Stories for Writers, and it's uh, managed by my colleague Angela Hicken, and it pairs up readers groups and book groups with professional writers. The groups each commission, each commission their writer to write them a short story, and the result is obviously great literature. And to validate such hyperbole, please welcome on screen, they've both popped up uh, at exactly the right moment, uh, Emma Pursehouse and Liam Brown. Hello. Welcome to you both. Hi, Liam. Hello, Jonathan. Good. OK, thank you for joining. So I'm going to ask you a bit about this this scheme, uh, or what your experience was going into it um, and what your experience was when you completed it. Let me start with Emma. Would you like to tell us a bit about um, which group you worked with and, and how it was for you? Yeah, um, I worked with Utoxita Library Reading Group, um, but it was during um, lockdown, so I couldn't actually go and meet them. So I sent them a questionnaire um, and they told me what they would want from a story. Uh, and it was very all very different and very, um, yeah, um, it didn't kind of match. So it was kind of having to weave those ideas in. But the questionnaire, I, I was, I, I sent them things like, can you give me the opening line you'd like from a story? Or can you give me the closing line you'd like from a story? And lots of things on character and what kind of 
what kind of writers they liked reading and I tried to kind of uh, engage them in a kind of questionnaire dialogue about that um, and it did work in actual fact I think um, I was able to kind of weave in a lot of stuff that people had said so hopefully when they read the story back they'd recognise that they'd been listened to. <laughs> So. Okay, um, I'm going to come to Liam in a moment, but just a second question for you. Um, the, the, we we assume that writers draw their ideas from the hand of God, as it were, inspiration from on high, uh, rather than a, a checklist um, being sent to you with certain box ticked. Uh, did, did that make it a more creative experience for you? Did you feel actually released by the fact that you knew you were writing something that people really wanted? Yeah, it was great fun. I thought I really enjoyed it. it. It wasn't a story I would have written without those questions. And I just kind of liked, I quite liked the idea of writing for a committee and to see whether I could weave it together so it didn't look like that, if you, if you see what I mean, so somebody else could pick it up and read it as a story. Um, hopefully I succeeded. Well, I, I, I know of the story and I feel you very much did. And and uh, I should say for people uh, watching that West Midlands Reads Network has uh, been involved in this scheme, run this scheme for over over a, do over a dozen years and, and wonderful stories have been created, which are then made available to readers groups. Um, and um, we, we can hopefully share some of those going forward. But let me move to Liam. So, Liam, um, I'm I'm hoping that you were actually in real space when you were involved with your committee. Is that the case? It is the case. Yes, I was um, lucky enough not to be doing it in lockdown. In fact, it was just a few months ago that uh, I, I took a journey to Tettenhall Library in Wolverhampton. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I was a little bit scared, felt a little bit nauseous. I was like, I'm going to be confronted by a group of readers. I like to keep readers at a firm distance wherever possible. Um, but in, in all seriousness, uh, I, we, I got into a room with 20 readers who I think they meet once a month in Tethanol Library to discuss a book. And uh, I brought all these prompts with me uh, to try and get them talking and try and fish out ideas. And it turned out I didn't need any of them. They were just they just pounced on me. Uh, yeah, like a cow, cat, a pack of cats with a fresh mouse. And they just, uh, yeah, they just spat out ideas. I could barely keep up. Smoke was coming from the pages. Um, and yet somehow I think it kind of it fell into place and uh, a beautiful sort of alchemy took place and uh, a story emerged. So, yeah, it was it was a sort of out of body experience. OK, well, I, I, we can tell you our writer, Liam. Um, you create a wonderful picture. Uh, yet another fire alarm going off due to the smoke coming from your uh, your quill. Um, let, let me ask you first, Liam, and then and then Emma, when you presented the story to your commissioning group, as it were. Um, how did that feel and what was their reaction? Uh, yeah, so when I presented the story, I was even more terrified than when I initially spoke to them, thinking, goodness me, there are so many different competing ideas. Have I managed to kind of cram them all in? But they were delighted and you could literally hear them just piping up saying, oh, that's me, that's my, you know, that's my story. Oh, I recognise that's my grandson that I managed to wedge in there. Oh. They gave me a list of names and I managed to get those in there. So it, it was lovely. And who knew that a group of uh, committed readers would also be such uh, frustrated writers, I think. And uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if many of them went off and actually wrote their own stories off the back of this. So. Well, that's good. But also fine, fine judges uh, with good literary taste is what, what we like to feel. They, they, yeah. So um, Emma, um, did you present yours online then to your group in New Toxeter or did you go and beard them in their den? No, they f they fed back and in in writing. I think it yeah. was it was so early on. I don't know if, if we quite mastered Zoom then. Uh -huh. So they all fed back and said how they'd felt about it. And exactly what Liam was saying, really, they kind of identified the bits that they knew were theirs and saying, "Oh God, it was great to see it there." And they were just, I think, just delighted to have been listened to and incorporated in the story. So it was, um, yeah, it was a lovely experience. And they even recommended readers to me. Uh, uh, writers to me that they'd read and thought I might like based on the story which was lovely because that was a two-way thing yeah Good. And, and to your knowledge had they had any awareness of your writing prior to being paired up with you Emma no I don't think so no, no. But, uh, I mean we like to think of course that they're 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 causing the uh, uh library shelves of Utoxida to be with your volumes filled well, it would be nice, but you know, I don't think no, they did, I don't think they were kind of particularly aware. Maybe they went and looked looked me up afterwards. I don't know. 
We, we hope so. If they're using the ask, ask for a book system, they're bound to have found you. Uh, Liam, you you were in real space, so I imagine you you arrived uh, accidentally carrying many of your volumes, uh, complete with a cash box. Um, were they aware of your writing in advance? Um, well, in fact, they they I, I suspect they researched me on the back of knowing I was going to come to visit them. Uh -huh. um, many of them were clutching a library copy of my book, which I was delighted to see. Um, and a couple of them had even gone out and bought it and I kindly assigned a copy for them. Um, and they gave me some, you know, harsh but fair critique of my writing, I think. Uh, and, you know, they seem they seem to like it. It was great to meet a bunch of new readers. I think they preferred the story they wrote to the one I wrote by myself, if I'm brutally honest. But, uh, yeah, no, it's great. And, you know, hopefully there's a, there's a bunch of new readers who'd never heard of me before. And now they do. So, yeah, good. Fantastic. I mean, we, we've enjoyed talking about the, the, the spirit of it. And and um, I mean, we know, particularly in the West Midlands, readers groups are harsh but fair, uh, which is which is how they treated you. And that, that's good. And I have observed with this project. But once the readers group get the short story by their writer, it is suddenly declared a work of the very highest merit uh, because it's their writer. So how could it not be brilliant? And um, they become kind of your supporters almost, irrespective of, you know, whether you happen to uh, have won the Booker Prize or not. Uh, all that lies ahead of course but to ask you both uh starting with perhaps emma uh a slightly bigger question having a, a work of prose fiction generated by its eventual its immediate readers that's that's unusual um do you think there is a bigger potential for this way of relating readers to writers and um, but maybe at some point in the future a bigger group with more time could commission a whole novel or something similar I, emma first and then i'll switch to liam yeah, I think so. I, I've done I've done a similar thing with school age children as well in the past um, through uh, writing West Midlands. And it was very similarly um, that young people really, really engaged with the whole idea, absolutely loved it. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it would be something that you probably could create a novel in that way, um, using lots of different people's ideas. It'd be an interesting thing to try. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of scope there for just kind of engaging people with reading and the process of writing in a different way. <laughs> and of course, uh, scholars of literary life will know that uh, historically novelists like Dickens were publishing their books in in short chapters and, and definitely getting the feedback on what passed for social media then in order to know how they might direct the story. Liam, do, do you feel that um, this is something you would do in the future? This is something you would recommend to other writers? Maybe this could be operated on a bigger scale? Yeah, it's a really interesting point because I think on paper it shouldn't work. Uh, you know, the, it, it's such a personal thing to go away and create a story and, as you say, you know, speak to the muse. But uh, it, it absolutely does work. And I think it really it felt like a collaborative piece, it, like genuinely a collaboration between readers and writers. It, it was their ideas that I would not have had without them. And and then I thought, well, if, if you think of a lot of the these culture defining television programs in this golden age of TV, be it The Sopranos or Breaking Bad or Succession, they're all written in t in, in writers rooms. Uh, and it felt a little bit like that, you know, get the whiteboard out, chuck out ideas. So I'd absolutely love to, you know, I'd love to be involved again. And I can see it. I can see it happening. I think. It, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and of course, you mentioned, you know, contemporary uh, culture. A lot of that is bolted onto the reaction of people watching the programs and so on and that's a big thing in a way you're kind of preempting that by having those who are going to read the short story already giving their reactions their views uh you know we want a beginning and middle and end that kind of uh sage advice uh which is maybe taking us a little bit further into giving our readers agency um emma did you feel at any point that the knowledge that these these group of people who you, you you didn't know them personally, but you knew they were waiting and watching. Did that in any point sort of stop your creativity and make you perhaps less imaginative because you were pinned down to their ideas or did it have the opposite effect? I think it had the opposite effect because I knew I'd got to incorporate them. The only thing that did happen to me that they'd asked for um, a cross-cultural story. So I, I was a little bit worried about writing it because like, um, uh, you know that there's lots of things about uh taking on other people's cultures so I had to put it past the sensitivity reader I just did that myself <laughs> if mm -hmm. you know what I mean so that was the only issue that came out of it for me that I was sort of writing something that I wouldn't have, wouldn't have tackled a character that I wouldn't have tackled if I hadn't been asked to do that 
And, and was that type of character, their characteristics, was that represented by the group? Was there somebody in the group who had those that bit of lived experience? I don't know, because obviously I didn't meet them in person. I imagine they must have been, but um, I don't actually yeah. know because I didn't meet them. Yeah. But you, you could see a, a way of analysing that to say that if, if someone in your commissioning group has that lived experience, even though they're not writing it, they, they've given you permission to write it because they say, exactly. no, we're, we're, yeah. this is how we want you to tackle this. And you can always test it with us if you feel you've got it wrong. Yeah. So that's how I felt about it and, and went for it. So... Great, good. And and Liam, were there any uh, any issues raised, ideas raised by your group that you felt you you really couldn't tackle? Uh, you don't need to disclose details, but something where you know you felt if I tackle that, I'm going to compromise myself in some way, or perhaps be dishonest to you know the the subject I'm describing. Again, that's that's a really interesting point. I think the thing they were most keen to see reflected in the writing was was to see the area that they came from in writing like time and time again it's like well we never read stories about people like us from around here no one says it's always it's always in that london um so they wanted but i'm not from wolverhampton so i i i was trying to glean as much detail you know as many details from them about their you know what was important to them and uh, i spent a lot of time on google maps afterwards kind of just doing a virtual tour of the streets and trying to get a sense of location um so you know i Hopefully I rose to the challenge, but that was definitely what they wanted to see. And that's, I think, when they, they read the story back, the thing they were most pleased about and most proud of to see themselves reflected in the story. Yes. Uh, well, that's that's a very interesting point you raised there, because, of course, one of the qualities of public libraries we most cherish is the fact that there are so many of them still, thankfully, and that they are in so many locations uh, of every disposition and that people feel a very personal attachment to a public library building. We've heard other speakers today reference that. Um, and you could see very happily that they could extend that that personal loyalty, not just to the building, but also to the writer who came to the building to listen to what they had to say. Um, uh, you 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 said you Google mapped it. You didn't. Um, you, did you go? You went to Tetton Hall originally, presumably to meet the group and sample their biscuits. I, I definitely sampled the biscuits. Yes. Um, no, I went to the library and I, I, I saw the library. So I was in there, but I think they wanted, you know, they, they wanted the streets. They wanted the houses. They wanted the uh, the Wolverhampton skies above their yeah. heads. Um, so I, I think I spent I probably spent about an hour and a half with them just talking um so yeah it was just kind of back doing some research afterwards once i'd kind of pieced together everything they'd said to me and suggested and put it into a story form that i just needed to go and tidy up a bit of research to try and make it as authentic as possible great great um we, we we've got a, a a few questions popping up i mean one I, I, i'm going to ask you both although i do also know the answer um it, uh, uh, um a viewer asking um uh, whether this was a project that you as writers did for the sheer love of Tetton Hall and Utoxeter, and why not? Those are uh, the jewels in the crown of the West Midlands, I like to think. Or, or did you receive a fee each? Uh, Liam, uh, would you have done it for love or were you waiting for the cheque? I, I mean, I, I'm, I was. I received a fee. <laughs> I received a fee, but that's not Good. to say I wouldn't have done it for love. Um, and having done it, it was actually such an enjoyable experience and pushed me so far out of my comfort zone. Uh, compared to the the usual stories I would have written, that I you know I I genuinely felt you know that I got a lot out of it beyond uh, filthy lucre. So okay, well that's that's very generous. I mean I know that both you and Emma are professional writers, and you know you need to you need to sell your skills in that way. Emma, you you also got a fee, but how how did you feel about that fee? What would I mean? I imagine you you'd love to have an extra naught dropped onto it, but <laughs> equally, was it was it also something that you might have done for love in a different occasion? Um. Probably not, because okay. <laughs> when I write for, for the love of it, that's coming from me, if that yeah. makes sense. And as you say, I'm a professional writer and uh, I need to keep the electric on. <laughs> so. OK, OK. So so um, money for the meter is what you're looking for both uh, or possibly some form of barter. But yeah. and of course, this is perfectly reasonable. But, you know, we want our professional artists to receive the money to allow them to continue to be professional artists. That includes includes writers like you both. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. And I just wanted to ask you both whether um, if you were offered this um, 
uh, idea by a library which was very distant from you in terms of its disposition. Locality was very different, or the culture was very different. You you both live in the West Midlands. Uh, you know, you have, you know, you don't live in New Toxeter, Emma, but you know, it's not very far away from Wolverhampton, and it, it shares some characteristics uh, uh, of the of the Midlands, self deprecating, high minded, um, uh, generous folk. Uh, and the same would be true of the good people at Tetton Hall. But would you take on such a thing if it came from a culture which is very different from you? If you were perhaps commissioned by um, a particular community in you know the north of Ireland or or a community in in Cornwall where perhaps you didn't have any any knowledge at all Emma first of all and then and then Liam um, yeah I would yeah I would because if you know if they were if if it was on offer and it was something interesting that I could get my teeth into I would um definitely because you'd work with them and they would know you weren't from there so I guess it would be getting to know each other so yeah I, yeah. I would and and a trip down to Cornwall is always a pleasure. So if they if they promise bed and board, it's even better. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just I'm just teeing you guys up for future work. Uh, Liam, how do you feel about being asked to do it in a in a in a region very far from the one you're familiar with? Yeah, I think that would be a, a learning experience for me. So I'd, I'd definitely be keen to do it. Um, I, I suspect I'd, I'd want to tweak the process a little bit so there was a little bit more back and forth like when it comes to editing, just to make sure that, you know, you've really kind of captured the, the voice. You don't want to kind of come out with, I read a story the other day and the, the, the portrayal of Birmingham and, the, and it was just so unrealistic. I was like, this, this person's never visited and it really gets under your skin. So, um, so yeah, I think I just want to do a bit more, a bit more fact checking and research, but yeah, I, I wouldn't rule it out. And presumably with more time, you could have given your two commissioning groups the chance to be a little bit more, demanding of you possibly to say them to them you know okay I finished it but you know if you really want to push me then push me a bit further I um do, do you think that it ha with more time I'll start with Emma first of all with more time would the group have have made more demands upon you or were they just sort of pleased enough to, to get what you'd written um I don't know I think that would really really have been quite interesting to take it back um another group I worked with which was a school I did take it back and they did get to do a little bit of that kind of no no that's not what we said so I think that process can work and I think it's a lovely process uh, and okay yeah that's well, it, it, it and, and Liam I imagine it, it depends a bit upon how sensitive you are to people uh, um uh <laughs> pushing on you yeah, I, I mean, like for this project, because there was a set time, it worked well in that format. But, you know, I, I guess they would say, you, you, how does a writer know when their work is finished? It's when their editor comes along and, and prizes out of their cold, dead hands. You know, okay. so it's difficult to know whether it's good to have a full stop. I think. Yeah. And of course, you, you're going to take it back to a group. There are more biscuits involved, so you've got to get it finished. Well, uh, the subject of biscuits, we, we've only got five minutes left of our afternoon. So I'm going to uh, join with all the people listening to say to thank you so much for your honesty about the process. It sounds fabulous. And uh, West Middles Reason Network will, will continue to do this kind of work, we hope, but it will be lovely to see it happening in other parts of the country. So um, goodbye to Emma and Liam, safe journeys home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. So now we come to the final uh, few minutes, five minutes or so of our uh, afternoon. I'm delighted to be joined by Sue Ball, who's Interim Libraries and Arts Manager for Staffordshire. Sue has been behind the scenes with us all afternoon, listening to our presentations, uh, making notes about what she feels we can glean from them. And Sue's going to just give a little bit of feedback so we can kind of gather together the disparate, the disparate themes. Sue, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. I think the the publicity for today's event states that promoting reading and engaging with readers is at the heart of the library and bookshop offer and the presentations we've heard today provide advice, guidance and ideas for engaging with readers. I think it was really good to hear Luke open today's presentations talking about the challenges but also the opportunities he sees for libraries and I think some key actions for us to think about are libraries as a front door to council services, anchor institutions bringing people people into towns and cities and villages and to think about the partners we work with. Partnerships are really important and also advocacy, how advocacy is key, you know, how we tell the stories about the difference our libraries are making to the, the people in our communities. I think then we had a really good panel session hosting all three events and oh my goodness, I got so many takeaway tips from this. Um, I think it was really 
interesting to hear Jess talk about communication with publicists and that email is really important um, and also that being transparent and honest about what we want to achieve or what we're looking for or what we can or can't do how we work with bookshops as well um, and then things to think about like audience capacity public transport for the author if they can't if they don't drive that old question around charging versus free activity um, and that on online presence it was good to hear Natalie talk about you know that the, the importance of social media for authors and also I think when Natalie was talking it really made me think about actually find out what the author wants to get out of this and uh, you know for Natalie it was so evident that it was a connection with readers that was really important for her. And then, of course, we had Naomi, and I thought that was a really fantastic uh, presentation about copyright. I think copyright issues is always a concern for library staff, and it was really insightful. For me, the takeaways were the four reflections, but also that uh, really useful website, copyrightuser.org, uh, and I'm going to go and have a look at this uh, website after we finish today. I think that was really useful. Um, then great to hear from Rachel and Anita and, and how um, the impact of um, Ask for a Book, not only on customers in Worcestershire, but also how it's engaging staff as well and um, really engaging them with their core offer of reading. And I think just to remind us, um, look out in April 24 uh, for that opportunity for new partners to come on board if you're interested and also that call to action uh, around the invitation to try and test out Ask for a Book on their website. And then, of course, our final session, it was really good to hear about the project with Liam and Emma. I have to say that Utoxeter is in Staffordshire and uh, to me the whole thing sounded did like a real challenge for Emma, uh, but fun and exciting for our, our readers. But actually, it's good to hear Emma and Liam talk about actually how fun and exciting it was for them too. And we were really delighted to host Emma um, with that project. It was really good. So I think thank you to all our speakers um, for such really informative sessions this afternoon. Thank you to Angela and Jonathan and Team Writing West Midlands for organising and running today. And over to you, Jonathan. OK, thank you very much, Sue. That's a lovely uh, summary of what we've uh, rattled through. It feels like we've been here a long time, uh, but it's not quite so long. It's uh, our two hours is up exactly at 1600 hours GMT. Uh, Angela's joined me back on the screen. Um, uh, Sue has very kindly thanked you and I, which was very generous of her. I would obviously like to thank you for being an exemplary uh, presenter of the early part of this. Um, and also to thank my colleagues behind the scenes, uh, Liv, Emma and Amelia, who have been ensuring that uh, the right people were on screen at the right time with the right presentation. We could not have done it without them, believe me. Um, Angela, I'll let you say the final few words before we depart. Thank you. Yeah, we hope you've really enjoyed our various presentations and panels that they provided you with food for thought, information and inspiration. And the film of the toolkit will be posted on the West Midlands Readers Network YouTube channel. And those who registered to attend today will receive that link and a short online survey, which we really do urge you to spend a couple of minutes completing. So thank you very much in advance for that. Uh, if you have a question from the sessions that you think's remained unanswered, or if you've thought of one since, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email was shared earlier in the chat, and it's on the West Midlands Readers Network website. So that just leaves me to say thank you so much to all our speakers, to my colleagues for their production and co-presenting, and thank you so much for your company at today's toolkit. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.